symptoms can be quite variable. So there are some people who get symptoms quite early on, so with relatively mild disease. And exactly why some people get symptoms early on and other people get symptoms only when the disease is quite progressed is not absolutely clear. There seems to be a, a, um, a, 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 a some sort of genetic tendency to develop increased filling pressures early with some people when they've got a restrictive cardiomyopathy, whereas other people don't develop increased filling pressures till late. Uh, so I think really it would be good if we could catch people prior to the development of symptoms. Once you've got symptoms, then you've already got increased filling pressures and it's pro perhaps a little late. But if they do have symptoms, I'd be recommending uh, investigating fully. And the, I think the important message here, and there, uh, I think that we, we would all agree, that breathlessness on its own is an abnormality, but that's not a diagnosis, that's just a symptom. An abnormal, abnormal echo with an increase in the, in the filling pressures, increase in wall thickness, um, you know, evidence of pulmonary hypertension, that's not a diagnosis either. That's, that's an observation based on ultrasound of the heart. We now need to drill down and understand it. And that's why what your question is exactly right. We need to think, what else could this be? What, what is it that we can look for that will truly identify what's going on inside that heart? So there's a series of, um, of pathological changes that, that occur in the, in the heart. It actually gets di directly taken up. The effect inside the heart is one of, uh, of, of uncoupling of, the, uh, of the, uh, the oxidative chain. That, that effect on the heart actually ends up uh, producing not only um, dysfunction as in a decrease in the, in the contractile capacity of the muscle, uh, but also cause an increase in the, in the thickness of, of the muscle as well. But thickness is not a major part of it, so an increase in left ventricular mass is not really a major feature of iron overload, but a, 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 a stiffening uh, as in a decrease in the relaxation capacity of the muscle is. So the uncoupling of the, uh, uh, of the relaxation sequence, the ATP-dependent relaxation sequence. Another thing to think about is, is the mechanism where, whereby the iron causes the, the, uh, the damage within the heart. Uh, so the, the, it actually, surprisingly enough, starts actually in the epicardium and then works through epicardium, through the myocardium, and then towards the endocardium. So on MRI, you can actually see the epicardial effect is, is, um, is, is the dominant effect to start with, and then it moves inward as the disease progresses. The iron is taken up actually through a copper receptor in the, in the myocardial muscle cell. But then once it's inside the myocardial muscle cell, there's a series of uh, reactions through the Fenton reaction, which then causes reacti reactive oxygen species. The reactive oxygen species result in um, uh, basically cell damage. So it starts off with, um, with, with a decrease in the contractile function of the muscle cell. The, you get this uncoupling of the relaxation sequence that normally happens with the actin myosin um, uh, or troponin and tropomyosin um, components of the, of the muscle cell. But over time, that results in cell death. And so you end up with, with causing fibrosis. And the end result of this is fibrosis of the heart. So clearly, once fibrosis has occurred, that's not fully reversible. But at the earlier stages, when there is not fibrosis, but when there is, there is damage to the, um, to the individual myocardial cells, but reversible, then a decrease in the level of iron uh, is actually theoretically at least possible to completely achieve normal cardiac function again. So symptoms become apparent when there is a, uh, enough iron deposition that it decreases the capacity of the heart to relax normally. When you start to get diastolic dysfunction, increase in filling pressures, then symptoms begin. Just remember with symptoms that they can be quite subtle to start with. So when when there's only relatively mild impairment of diastolic relaxation. The symptoms might only come with hard exertion. So the individual sometimes notices it, whereas if I'm looking as a clinician, it may not be that obvious to look at for me, and even on stress echo it might not be that abnormal, but the individual can see a small change. As time goes on, then that change will become more obvious and you know, less exertion, it comes out more, and of course the changes would also occur at rest. So there is sometimes a role for, for exercising these people to see uh, whether or not the symptoms can be brought on and whether we can find uh, abnormalities that occur with exercise. There's such a thing called a diastolic stress test where we exercise and look at those same markers I talked about earlier, not just at rest, but also to look at them with exercise.
So as far as really definitively diagnosing it, though, as I mentioned earlier, we can't make a definitive diagnosis based on echocardiography. We can find diastolic abnormalities, and then that gives us an index of suspicion to look further. And the gold standard test is cardiac MRI. The, the T2 star is the, uh, is the best sequence uh, within the cardiac MRI. And, and there are two numbers that are worth mentioning. One is 20 milliseconds, and the other one is 10 milliseconds. So basically that's the speed of the relaxation. Uh, and if, if it's less than 20 milliseconds for the, for the first, uh, the first uh, set of abnormalities to appear, then that is very suggestive of iron overload. Less than 10 is almost diagnostic of iron overload. So there's two treatments, well, three if you include uh, venesection. So venesection in, in removing blood um, uh, in the form of a, like a transfusion uh, will, um, uh, will donating blood basically, removing at regular times until such time as the iron stores become no normal, just continuing it until such time. Uh, then there's desferioxamine, which is intravenous iron chelation therapy. Then there's now an oral version available only if uh, the desferioxamine is, um, is not tolerated uh, or if there's severe iron overload that's not responding uh, appropriately to, um, uh, to desferioxamine. I think it depends on the individual and the degree of, the degree of iron overload. Um, it, it also depends on the individual preferences. Uh, you know, intravenous chelation therapy using, using intravenous therapy is... Um, is you know it's troublesome. It's um, it's cumbersome. It's um, it requires a commitment from the patient. If there's geographical limitations and they can't get to a place where that that is uh, easily achievable, you know that might put extraordinary um, constraints on the patient. So I think there's a number of factors to take into account there. It's not uh, one size fits all. I think it depends on the cause of the iron overload. So in somebody, for example, who's had re repeated transfusions and they need the transfusions for whatever reason, let's say they've got you know, thalassemia major or sickle cell disease, but they have to have regular transfusions, then we don't really have a choice as, as far as we have to remove the iron uh, by some other means. A venesection is not going to be a solution for them. Uh, and, and so the challenges from, from a cardiology perspective is we need to follow these people up to make sure that not only is their iron serum level at an appropriate, um, you know, appropriate level, but also have the cardiac changes that they started developing before actually resolved. So everybody with a restrictive cardiomyopathy and iron overload is no exception to that, does require regular review. So I bring all of my patients back. Um, well, I would start off with every three months to make sure that they are symptomatically stable and improving make sure that their echo is no worse, hopefully improving, uh, repeat the MRI and make sure that the, that the actual level of iron is decreasing uh, with the goal of getting them completely back to normal. I think realistically not everybody will return completely to normal once they've got quite established iron overload, but if we can catch them at an earlier stage, get them at the point where they haven't got a myocardial fibrosis, uh, and try to reverse the process little bit by little bit, then we should be able to achieve an excellent result in the majority of people. And I suppose that brings us to an important take-home message, which is have an index of suspicion. Don't, don't, be, don't expect that uh, it, you, you, know, you have to have dramatic symptoms in order to make this diagnosis. You can make the diagnosis with actually quite mild symptoms. I think the biggest challenge will actually be the level of understanding in the medical community because this is not something that was talked about that much. There's not a lot of discussion about it. And I'm actually really glad that this forum has become available because, you know, I, I hope that there's a, a lot more um, press and discussion and, and uh, you know, amongst my colleagues, um, you know, that, that, yeah, that, that the, the community of doctors in Australia who see this type of patient need to have this as something that they're thinking about. One of the challenges that I've, I've found in, in um, one of my areas of interest, which is pulmonary hypertension, is that people just don't think about it. And it's not that they're saying it, it's not a condition and it doesn't matter, but it's more that the thought doesn't even occur to them. So if somebody comes in with breathlessness, they're not thinking, they're thinking coronary disease, they're thinking valvular heart disease, but they're not thinking pulmonary hypertension. So it's something that always comes out as a surprise if they go, oh, look, they've got pulmonary hypertension. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. Whereas if we're investigating for, with an open mind and a series of things that, that could occur, 
as long as you've got a high enough in index of suspicion, you're not going to miss anything. And I think that's the thing that we want to, that the message has to come across, that, that, that um, they're, they're, these, these are important conditions and they need to be um, thought about. Uh, and as long as, as long as the message gets out there, then I think we're absolutely on the right track. This is a, an interesting evolution. So um, I had a, a, a large practice in Armidale, which is a, a, a suburb of Perth in Western Australia. Um, so Armidale uh, had a, a, quite a static population and it was a perfect population to study the community prevalence of diseases. And because I had the biggest lab in that area, uh, we decided to do a community prevalence study of pulmonary hypertension with one of my colleagues who was doing his PhD at the time, Jeff Strange. And what we found was that pulmonary hypertension was far more common than had ever been reported before. So in this little pocket in the middle of nowhere in Western Australia was pulmonary hypertension was common. When we looked at the, the mortality data, we found that not only is pulmonary hypertension common, it's also associated with a very, very high mortality. And the commonest cause of pulmonary hypertension is left heart disease, many different left heart diseases, including iron overload. So, um, so when, we, when we looked at, the, um, at this, uh, this data and published it in Heart in 2012, um, it, was, it turned out that this study was the biggest that had ever been done before and it had the most sobering results that had ever been published before. But we got a lot of questions because we thought, you know, who are these people? What are they doing in the middle of uh, you know, the, a town in Australia? It can't really mean very much. And we knew we were right. So we decided that the only way to really answer this question properly was to do the big, biggest echo database we possibly could. So, um, so we decided that this really needed to become national and we needed to do a national study that involved um, every um, state, every territory, uh, that involved multiple different hospitals, uh, health services, private echo labs, public echo labs, research labs, um, uh, standard clinical labs. So get the best possible cross-section. So fast forward, we got some funding and we, um, and we went ahead and did the study. So now in 2019, we have over 1.1 million echoes on about 750,000 Australians, uh, all of it linked with mortality. And we have data linkage with the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. And so we've been able to look at the risk of mortality associated with every single measured echo variable. So this year we've had two publications in the Journal of American College of Cardiology. Uh, what the first one was on pulmonary hypertension, so the follow-up of that original paper I told you about just now, uh, and we confirmed exactly what we had shown before, but this time on a massive population, uh, and also confirmed that the, the, the risk of mortality in pulmonary hypertension starts at 30 millimetres of mercury, which is actually earlier than has been published before, and then has a progressive increase the higher that pulmonary artery pressure. The second paper we, we, um, uh, we published in Jack was on aortic stenosis and the risk uh, of mortality associated with varying degrees of aortic stenosis. And that was actually something that, that we, we, we presented also at the European Society of Cardiology meeting at uh, the late breaking science session. And it was simultaneously published in Jack while that presentation was underway. Uh, and what we found there was again, that there's a gradient of risk. So severe aortic stenosis, as everybody already knows, is associated with a high mortality rate if left untreated. But what wasn't previously known is that moderate aortic stenosis is associated with a very similar mortality risk to severe aortic stenosis if left untreated. And our current recommendations, the guidelines say, what do you do with moderate aortic stenosis? You watchfully wait. You don't treat them, you wait till they become severe. But unfortunately, while doing that, it appears that a, a number of these people are actually dying without any treatment at all. And that obviously has raised big alarm bells. So, it's, so the data that we're getting out of this is really important and we've been able to, to raise questions, um, not necessarily all the answers yet. We have to work on getting the answers. We need clinical trials to get the answers. Uh, but so the National Echo Database of Australia is showing to be a really, really valuable resource to be able to give us very important data about the true prevalence of a number of different cardiac diseases that happen in Australia. you kind of have to be a little bit like a dog with a bone. You know, you have to just say, okay, something's wrong here. Let's not let go until we've, until we've nailed it. So the, the, the sequence of investigations, we, we, want it to, we want to be sure. So we have to say, if you don't feel 100% satisfied with the information you've got so far from investigation, 
go and do something else and work it out because if the person is affected, so you have, always have to keep at the centre of your thinking, this is about the patient. We're doing this for the benefit of our patients. And if the patient is affected, then we need to keep looking until we've worked out what's wrong with them. I think we are heading in the right direction, but I think there's room to improve further. Uh, it's the, I think the level of understanding of hemochromatosis and from me as a cardiologist, how it affects the heart, I think we could do more. I think we need to have more information. Uh, in some ways, we, we need to have um, a, a, a process whereby the, um, the dissemination information is coordinated. Hemochromatosis Australia seems like the perfect uh, organisation or support group to be able to present that information, uh, and I, I would certainly be happy to support that. Uh, the, um, the way in which it's presented, I think, through education, as is currently being done, is, is excellent. I think we need more research as well. Uh, the, um, the picking up people at an early stage of disease, protocols and proformers to try to say, well, you know, at this point, this is the right time to start to do these tests and have a flow chart of what tests to do at the right time. I think we could do a little bit more work on that as well. And, uh, and also algorithms on, on um, the initiation of treatment based on the, um, uh, on the level of iron overload that's found for that individual. So I, I think there's, there's more we can do, but I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm.